What is up, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Guns, Nerds, and Steel. Today I present to you the Beginner's Guide to Seven Days to Die, a complete walkthrough to get you through the first seven days of your zombie apocalypse. We'll cover the best perks to take, the best weapons to use, the best places to go, and the best things to do in the early game to set yourself up for long-lasting success. Timestamps below if you need to jump around, or reference back in the future, but otherwise, let's begin. For a beginner, you should start on a pre-gen or random gen map, and I would advise you to stick with the default settings for your first run. But if you wish to reduce the grind a little bit, you can increase the player block damage to make mining for resources, breaking open chests, and forced entry into buildings a bit faster. The Horde Knight zombie setting doesn't actually reflect the number of zombies you will see on Horde Knight. It is simply a hard cap, which will only be reached in the later stages of a playthrough. The game will apply a variable soft cap of concurrent zombies on Horde Knight, appropriate for your level. When you start the game, you'll be naked and unarmed, but you'll be relatively safe in the starting zone. The game grants you what is called the Newbie Coat. The Newbie Coat grants you decreased food and water loss, less stamina usage, and increased weather resistance, but progressively fades away over the first five levels. There will be no zombies in your spawn vicinity, allowing you to get your bearings in relative peace. But all good things must come to an end, so complete the beginner quests as they appear on your screen to familiarize yourself with the crafting system. You can always check an item to see which recipes require it if you're unsure of what to keep. Once complete, you'll be given four free skill points. While there aren't really any right or wrong choices, there are four that I would urge you to consider very early on as a beginner. Number one, Sexual Tyrannosaurus. Perhaps the most useful perk in the game, Sexy T-Rex is practically mandatory if you have any plans of being a melee fighter or resource gatherer. This helps you manage your stamina, and when upgraded, it will allow you to use the heavier iron and steel tools much more effectively. Number two, Miner 69er. This will allow you to craft higher quality tools and will forever make your life easier when mining and resource gathering. Number three, the melee weapon of your choice. This will allow you to craft higher quality melee weapons and make you more dangerous when using them. You cannot go wrong with sledgehammers or clubs. Knives and brawling require a bit of skill because you need to get closer to the zombies but are still deadly. Spears are okay, but the power attacks require you to throw your weapon, which can render you unarmed. And batons are specialty weapons that I would just suggest that you avoid. Number four, Master Chef. Often overlooked, if you don't take this perk, you'll need to rely on finding or buying all of your food until you stumble across some of the recipes that allow you to cook raw meat. A Master Chef can most notably make tea, coffee, and boiled meat. Check kitchens or restaurants for a cooking pot and gather all of the meat you can. Food is important not just for hunger, but also first aid. Do yourself a favor and take this perk. And here are a couple that you should avoid. Number one, Pack Mule. One of your early goals should be to craft single clothing pocket mods. Be on the lookout for double clothing pocket mods and all armor pocket mods and their schematics as well. You can wear a total of three clothing pocket mods, giving you plus one slot in the backpack each. You just need duct tape, cloth, sewing kits, and leather, so save these items. Other strategies to manage your inventory include using the new drone, using your vehicle inventory, or placing storage boxes for your extra items. You have so many other priorities in the early game, and you don't need to spend points here to unlock the entire backpack. Number two, Lucky Looter. It may sound tempting to sink points into Lucky Looter early on, but Lucky Looter gives you a percentage modifier of 5% per level. You can check your loot stage in the character stats. Loot stage is equal to your level and is completely separate from your game stage. Simply put, Loot stage affects the loot that you find, and game stage affects the zombies you find. You get no loot stage bonus in the forest biome. You get a mild loot stage bonus in the desert or burned biome, a moderate loot stage bonus in the snow biome, and a major loot stage bonus in the wasteland. And you get a loot stage bonus of plus three in cities and towns. At loot stage 20, which you will be several days from reaching on day one, one point into Lucky Looter would increase your loot stage to 21. Three points would get you to 23. <laughs> you can see how this is not very helpful. 
However, at loot stage 100, three points would get you up to 115. There are certain loot stage thresholds which, when reached, instantly unlock better loot. They are Tier 0, Game Stage 0 to 11, Tier 1, Loot Stage 12 to 49, Tier 2, Level 50 to 90, and Tier 3, Level 90 and above. Long story short, Lucky Looter is only worth it in the mid to late game or if it were to propel you to the next loot tier a few days early. Okay, so with the skill points out of the way, you'll then be directed to the nearest trader and you should head directly there. Loot anything you can along the way and start building a stockpile of supplies. Keep an eye out for small game which you can kill and harvest for meat, but watch out for wolves, bears, hogs, and mountain lions which will fight back. Harvest gut piles for bones and craft a bone knife for more efficient meat harvesting. Speaking of meat, it's time to meet the trader. Once you arrive at the trader, search the compound for supplies and take everything you find. There will be one of each crafting station. Some may even be working, and if they are, you'll be using it for the next several weeks. If not, they have a chance to contain the schematic for you to build one of your own later. Pay attention to these book icons. If it's closed, it means you've never read it. And if it's open, you've read it before and you can safely sell it to the trader for XP and dukes. You may stumble onto working workstations during your travels, in which case you'll want to mark it on your map so you can return to use it later. When you talk to the trader, take a quest. The nearest one will do. Tier 1 buried supplies will likely contain food, so if you get desperately hungry, keep that in mind. But digging for several hours with poor quality tools is not really how you want to spend your first day, and the stamina usage while digging will only accelerate your food consumption, so take a fetch or clear instead. Later on, Tier 2 and 3 buried supplies will contain weapons, armor, mods, and schematics. Some things to keep an eye out for early on at the trader include certain books, such as Urban Combat Volume 6, where armor doesn't slow you down in combat, and the books that give you a flat plus 10% damage with your weapon of choice. You should also shop for certain schematics, like the workbench schematic, or rare item schematics for things like the auger or crucible. Other useful items include a helmet flashlight, lucky goggles, nerdy glasses, a cigar, a college jacket, a few select mods like the bandolier, weighted head, ergonomic grip, burning shaft, and potentially others depending on what skill path you've chosen. Big purchases to target in the coming days would include quality 2 tier 1 ranged weapons such as an AK-47, pistol, double barrel shotgun, wooden bow, or iron crossbow, which can be life-saving, game-changing investments. As you leave the trader to embark on your first quest, keep a lookout for small to medium-sized buildings that look strong and fortified, preferably something with two stories. Your quest location might make a good enough home base, but have some backup locations in mind. You'll want to live as close as possible to the trader to cut down on travel time and have easy access to the vending machines and or crafting stations. The two candies to start stocking up on are sugar butts and eye candy. Eye candy is great for giving a bonus to your loot stage and can influence the quality of items you get, particularly from loot crates and chests. Sugar Butts is best used for bulk selling at the trader. In general, save your sellables for when you can utilize Sugar Butts. Once you arrive at your destination, you have two choices. Proceed with the quest by activating the button or alternatively, clear the location out first. Once clear, you can then activate the quest marker to completely reset the building, zombies and loot included, and do the whole thing over again. You may wish to make questing an early priority. By completing 7 quests, you'll be granted the option to select a bicycle for a bonus reward. Questing is a great way to progress early on. It directs you to manageable POIs, gives you bonus loot rewards, bonus XP, bonus dukes, and after 7 quests, you'll be given directions to the next closest trader. You'll finally have some wheels to store your items in, and a dramatically faster and safer mode of transport. You should be able to do these 7 quests in 2-3 to three days, depending on how much you focus on it. Keep an eye out for critical early game items. A wrench will allow you to break down complex items into component parts, and will be necessary to obtain certain items like engines, batteries, radiators, forged iron, and forged steel 
among others. A level 1 pistol can be found in a toilet, and it's never a bad item to have early on. Apart from traitor guns and the toilet pistol, you'll be restricted to pipe guns for the first week or two. First aid can save your life in case that wasn't already clear. Always have something ready to use in case you sustain a critical injury. Painkillers cure concussions and restore health instantly. Bandages stop bleeding from deep lacerations and sewing kits can cure them all together. Antibiotics, including honey, which can be obtained from tree stumps, will cure infections if treated early enough. Antibiotics are quite uncommon, so try to get a bit of a stockpile going. Traders have a 50% chance to have them in stock at any given time. First aid bandages and aloe vera cream treat abrasions, while splints and casts treat fractures. Vitamins treat fatigue. There is no cure for a sprained arm or leg, you'll just have to wait it out. However, a health bar can increase healing time by 50%. Finally, you'll want to keep an eye out for glue and pipes. You'll need these, along with some wood, to craft pipe guns. You can craft pipes with forged iron or harvest them from sinks and toilets. You can find glue in trash or craft it using murky water and bones in a campfire as long as you have a cooking pot. Once you start finding ammo, you should carry at least one and potentially up to three pipe guns. One for each ammo type. Putting mods onto your weapons will not only give you unique benefits, but it will also boost base damage by 10% each, no matter what the mod is. Archery is a completely viable early game ranged weapon. Arrows are cheap to make and sneak attacks deal 3.5 times damage at baseline. Bows and crossbows can even carry you into the late game and can benefit greatly from books and perks that give damage bonuses. After you've done some looting and shopping at the trader, you'll need a place to call home. Ideally, you want a strong building that can withstand a bit of chaos. Most players will live in a POI for the first week or two as they stockpile building materials for construction of a dedicated horde base later on. To do this, you need to understand the relatively simple 7 days to die zombie pathing AI. Zombies will take the path of least resistance to get to you, that is, if they can get to you. If they cannot reach you, they will turn to attacking the structural supports to where you are standing and yes, they know exactly which blocks are holding you up. Essentially, you have three primary strategies for a horde base. Number one, create a bunker style base on the ground level with at least one opening intended for fighting zombies from. This can be dangerous unless you can predict exactly where they will attack from, and that can take some experience to get right. Number two, make a tower base and shoot down on zombies from above. This is probably the most beginner friendly base design because zombies can't get to you, but you must ensure that your supports are strong enough to last the night. Number three, create a hybrid of the two, an elevated base that has a stairway and or causeway leading up to the side. Because there is a way for zombies to get to you, they will take that path. This leads to a predictable flow of zombie traffic to one fighting location and is arguably the most effective way to fight a horde. Once you have a general idea of how to fight invading zombies, you'll need a fighting position. This can be something simple, like a hatch and a door frame, or something a bit more elaborate, like this fighting position right here. It's never a bad idea to have a fallback position in case things get hairy. Try to keep your loot and valuables out of the way or at a separate location entirely, where they won't get inadvertently destroyed. If you've set up inside an existing POI, make sure you place your bedroll and or land claim block in your house to prevent the sleepers that you killed from respawning, and drag some random zombies in for a test run before you put it to the ultimate test on the 22nd hour of the 7th day when the zombie horde arrives. When you first start, it's generally a good idea to stay home at night and tend to your daily chores. Spend your nights cooking, crafting, organizing, building, upgrading around the base, and mining for stone or whatever else you can find underneath your base. If you decide to mine under your base, be careful not to mine under the walls. If a block does not have an uninterrupted connection to bedrock beneath it, the deepest boundary of the play area, it will no longer be considered structurally stable and will borrow stability from adjacent blocks. This may eventually cause a collapse. Keep lights, noise, and fires to a minimum to reduce heat generation. Heat builds up and cools off over time, 
and when a critical threshold is crossed, a screamer will spawn. She will hunt for you, and if discovered, she will summon a small horde of zombies to attack you. That small horde may contain additional screamers, so be weary that things may get out of control very quickly. Heat is also generated by breaking blocks, but if you sneak, you generate 50% less heat for every block that you break. This is useful for generating less heat while mining. You can check the vending machine every day for food, drinks, and candy. The food sold in vending machines is significantly cheaper than the same food sold by the trader. But remember, scavenged food is free. Food items, drinks, candy, and other consumables will stack up to three times to give you long-lasting buffs, which can be handy when stacked before a long mining session or before horde night. Each trader's inventory restocks every three days starting on day four, and all traders restock at the same time. After a restock, anything you've sold to them will be gone forever. Taking points into better barter is widely considered to be overwhelmingly powerful. The first two points increase your profits, but starting at level 3, you begin to unlock better items in the secret stash. You should find an airdrop every three days for some free loot, and this will always happen on Trader Day as a reminder. Otherwise, you should spend your days exploring, looting, and questing. Time is the ultimate resource, so don't let it go to waste. Be as productive as you can, and try to reserve the monotonous tasks for nighttime. There are many strategies to level up quickly. For the beginner, it's important not to level up too quickly. The challenge escalates fast and you must take some time to learn the game before things get out of hand. Killing zombies, mining, and construction are among the best ways to gain XP and level up in the early game. Too much time focused on any one task will see your development become imbalanced. You don't want to spend all of your time looting and find that your base is a little inadequate come Horde Night, but similarly, you don't want to spend all of your time building only to be forced to defend your base with primitive weapons and limited ammo. I have a dedicated video on how to level up heckin' fast, but I'll break down three strategies for you here real quick. Number one, wear nerdy glasses all the time. You'll get a flat 10% more XP in everything you do. Number two, maximize your profits at the trader. Use sugar butts, add extra mods to your highest quality items for increased value, and repair what you can before selling. And use the awesome sauce when you have it. Each duke earned is one XP. Number three, get the most out of learning elixir. Drinking one of these before a major construction project or horde night can net you a ton of bonus XP. Prioritize saving the resources for this. Red tea, dog food, beer, acid, and super corn, and buy them whenever you see them in stock at the trader. As you level up, you'll get more and more skill points to spend. Each skill tree has great perks and lackluster perks. It can be difficult to decide which direction to go in, but for the beginner, it's hard to go wrong with strength. Strength allows you to fight better with arguably the three best weapons in the game. Shotguns, the clubs, and the sledgehammers. It allows you to fight longer with sexy T-Rex. It allows you to become a better resource gatherer with Miner 69er and Mother Load. You'll be able to spec into heavy armor to stand up to the zombies better, and you'll have access to the cooking perks, which are not that bad to have either. In all, it's difficult to progress in the game without having at least a few points into strength. Perception has some specific uses, the best probably being the Demolitions Expert tree, which will, with one point investment, allow you to craft pipe bombs and do more damage with all explosives, as well as Lucky Looter, which we have already discussed. Salvage operations can turn car harvesting into a pretty lucrative activity, and the Penetrator perk can help in the late game. Fortitude does have some amazing perks in it, and it can allow you to create a truly dangerous build, the Invincible Brawler. However, there can be a little bit of nuance to some of these perks, like how Healing Factor saps your hunger meter more quickly, or how the Brawling perk is completely OP, but only really when you've correctly built your character for it, stockpiled candy and first aid, and read most of the Brawling books. But perks like Rule Number 1 Cardio, Iron Gut, Pain Tolerance, and Living Off the Land can be incredibly useful. Intelligence is another amazing skill tree allowing you to become a master engineer. Craft traps, 
workstations, and vehicles with these perks, and utilize automation to become the master of your domain. And you can use Better Barter and Daring Adventurer to exploit the traders. Yet again, it's hard to progress without some points into intellect skills. Just be sure to pay attention to the recipes and crafting requirements before you progress too far. There's nothing more frustrating than unlocking the 4x4 through perks only to realize how much forged steel you need to actually craft it. And this brings us to agility. My personal favorite, the agility tree is both fun and user friendly. It allows you to focus on an avoidance playstyle, whether it be sneaking, jumping, running, or hiding, you'll be harder to hit and more difficult to find for the zombies. Knives, bows, and pistols make an excellent offensive loadout, and parkour will allow you to bound out of almost any sticky situation. So you've made it through the first week one way or another, and it's time to put your base to the ultimate test. It's the night we've all been waiting for. It's Horde Night. I explain Horde Night in depth in a separate video, but for your first Horde, you can expect two waves. One will begin at 2200. The next one will begin when the first one is defeated or at midnight, whichever is first. You'll want to make sure you brought repair supplies, first aid, food, water, ammo, repair kits, extra weapons, explosives, consumables, and a plan. Many players will store Horde Knight specific supplies in a separate box so that commonly forgotten items are kept together in one place. Don't forget to have repair tools handy. You can repair blocks as needed throughout the night. Just don't get too focused on killing and forget to check the blocks for damage. When the fight is concluded, all will be quiet. Double check that it's not a lull between waves and head out to check the damage and the spoils. The rest of the game is simply an expansion upon the first week. You'll repeat many of the same tasks again and again, finding better loot, using better equipment, scaling up your base, and exploring new locations. The game has no story and no ending. You make them for yourself. The true beauty of Seven Days to Die is that it's completely open-ended. You set the conditions and you make the rules. There are so many things to learn and discover about the game, and I hope that you enjoy it as much as I do. I truly hope that you found some of this information helpful. If you have any questions or need help with anything at all, hop onto my community Discord server and we'll be happy to assist you. You can also jump onto the GNS multiplayer server and play along with me and my friends. Check out the description of this video for links. And here's my pitch to you. Join the ranks of the Nerds of Steel by hitting that subscribe button, and I'll continue to present to you tutorials, deep dives into game mechanics, let's play content, base builds, live streams, game news, and more. You now have all of the information that you need to make it through the first week, but you'll still be learning new things about the game each and every time you play, and I'll do my best to help you out along the way. Thank you for watching, and goodbye. While you're waiting for the next video, check out the links below for more content, ways to support the channel, and ways to become a nerd of steel. You can catch me on the Discord, Twitter, at the weekly live stream, or in the comment section down below. Huge thank you to all of my supporters who helped grow and shape this channel. My name is Temreki, and I hope that I've earned your subscription today. I'll see you next time.